This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. In our fourth and final podcast of the Institute's first annual military history symposium entitled The Centenary of the Great War, A Canadian Perspective, Dr. Jack Granitstein speaks to the politics of Canadian conscription in the Great War. 1918, please join with me in welcoming him to our symposium. Thank you very much. I should begin by saying that I have the first cold of the autumn, and I'm not sure my voice will last through the entire talk, but I'll struggle to do my best. Conscription is one of the great divisive Canadian issues. In the two world wars, it tore the country apart, pitting French Canadians against Anglos, rural against urban dwellers, ethnics against the majority. Because he had seen the fracas in 1917, 1918, and because he learned from it, Mackenzie King handled the issue better in the Second World War than Sir Robert Borden in the Great War. But the question was still fraught. My intent now is to talk about the political and military purposes and the impact of compulsory service in the Great War. Germany might have been the land of Bach and Schumann, but most Canadians in the years before 1914 saw it as a nation whose leaders sought to impose their militaristic culture on Europe. Most Canadians instinctively and uncritically sided with Britain and France, Canada's mother countries, and rejected what they believed was the Kaiser's challenge to the peace of the world. The war that began in August 1914 left Canada with no choice. As a British colony, it was automatically at war when Britain was at war. And men flocked to the colors in 1914 and 1950. Most, it soon became clear, were recent immigrants from Britain. Those who had come to Canada in search of a better life than they could find in the old country but who still retained close ties to Ohm. Slower to enlist were the Canadian-born, whatever their ethnicity, and slowest of all were French-speaking Canadians, their ties to Europe three centuries distant. A secret British War Office study had calculated at the beginning of 1917 that under 10% of Canada's men had enlisted. The researchers found that 37.5% of British-born Canadians and only 6.1% of the Canadian-born of British extraction had joined, and only 1.4% of French Canadians. The War Office study labeling this the lowest rate in the White Empire. It was very close to the armistice in 1918 before a majority of the Canadian Expeditionary Force was born in Canada. And my estimate is that at most 15,000 Francophones volunteered over the course of the war. Quebecois pointed out that they got married earlier, that they had large families, that they were more rural than English Canada. There was substantial truth in these justifications and complaints and also in the resentment that had been stirred up by the efforts of the Ontario government to put regulations in place to constrain French language education. But the real truth was that in English Canada, the pressure on men was to enlist. In French Canada, the pressure was not to enlist. The church, the newspapers, their families all argued against supporting Britain's war by joining the army. To Francophones, the conflict was viewed as another imperialist war, and certainly not Canada's, which was unthreatened. French Canadians argued that they would defend Canada if it was attacked, but not join up when it was not. Nonetheless, as casualties in the trenches increased, as the war hung in the balance, the demand was for more men, always more men. And by late 1916, 
the number of volunteers coming forward each month was far fewer than the number of killed and wounded. The answer many across the country believed was clear. Conscription, compulsory military service. The impact of this issue on Canada, its politics and its army overseas would prove to be profound. Conscription aroused passions. The British born, those of recent British origin and those families that had men at the front reacted one way to compulsory service. So too, naturally enough, did those who were too old to be drafted. But for those fit men between the ages of 20 and 45, for French-speaking Canadians and for many Canadians from other parts of the world, service in the expeditionary force had no appeal. Indeed, it was to be resisted. No democratic government can oppose a measure such as conscription without public support. But governments have many tools at their disposal, and a prime minister willing to be ruthlessly creative can tilt the balance in his and his party's favor. Sir Robert Borden, the leader of the Conservative Party and prime minister from 1911, believed fervently that the Germans must be defeated and that Canada must do its full part in the struggle. To achieve this, there was almost nothing he would not do. Borden was no inspiring leader. He was a wooden speaker, a poor manager of his cabinet and caucus, not least in keeping his few French-speaking members of parliament at his side. He had begun the war pledging that there would be no conscription, but he was always determined to back up the soldiers at the front. After he visited France and England in the Vimy Spring of 1917, after he'd learned the toll of the dead and visited the wounded in the military hospitals, after he'd become persuaded that the Allies would lose the war unless more men were found, he came back to Ottawa with his mind made up. Conscription was essential if the Canadian Corps of four divisions was to be kept at full strength. As he wrote, he had had the privilege of looking into the eyes of tens of thousands of men at the front who look to us for the effort which will make their sacrifice serve the great purpose for which it was intended. But the Prime Minister knew that this course was certain to divide the country. After he had revealed his plans for conscription to Parliament on May 18th, he approached Sir Wilfrid Laurier, the Liberal leader, and proposed a coalition to bring in the conscription legislation. Our minister is afraid of a general election, Borden wrote in his diary after meeting Laurier. Think we would be beaten by French foreigners slackers. Laurier pondered the offer of a coalition and consulted his colleagues, but he declined, though he said, as Borden wrote in his diary, he will endeavor to have the law observed. What the Liberal leader feared was that if he supported conscription, he would destroy his standing in Quebec and turn over power to extremist, nationalist zealots such as Henri Bourassa, the editor of Montreal's newspaper Le Devoir. In fact, Borden had only two French-speaking ministers in his cabinet, Patneau and Blondin, and both assessed the Quebec situation much as Laurier had. He, they told their cabinet colleagues that conscription will kill them politically and the party in French Canada for 25 years. They were right. With Laurier refusing to join a coalition, Borden set out to find prominent Liberals willing to come into his government. While the military service bill, the conscription bill, that sought to put 100,000 men into uniform, was quickly being drafted and would pass through Parliament in July, his first efforts failed as Laurier's caucus remained loyal to the old leader. The Prime Minister then decided that the government needed political incentives in the form of two additional measures, the wartime elections bill and the military voters bill. The first gave the vote to women relatives of soldiers, the first time that any women would be allowed to vote 
in a national election. It also removed the vote from naturalized immigrants who had come to Canada from enemy nations. The Soldiers' Bill let all men and women in uniform cast a vote for the government or the opposition, no matter how long they had lived in Canada. If they could not name their constituency, their votes, their votes would be assigned to a riding. The two bills worked wonders. They shrank the ranks of light, likely anti-conscriptionist immigrants, expanded the pro-conscription vote by adding women relatives of soldiers, and allowed for a potentially massive manipulation of the soldier vote. These were ruthless measures, testimony to Borden's determination to win the war, impose conscription, sweep the next election to enforce it, and keep in power. A third bill, which turned out to be important because there was a lot of pressure for the conscription of wealth if men were to be conscripted, a third bill created the income tax, a conscription of wealth measure demanded by the Liberals, and by some in high finance who feared for the credit of Canada. A fine new book by Elspeth Heyman called Tax, Order and Good Government goes into this in detail and in fact changes the story of wartime Canada quite dramatically and convincingly, including how the election of 1917 was won and how and why conscription was put into effect. I got this book three days ago and I've only read the chapter on, on wartime. It is very powerful and for those of you who think you know all about the war, this will turn things upside down for you. The two franchise bills, when enacted, effectively destroyed liberal support in Western Canada heavily dependent on naturalized immigrants who had arrived during Laurier's period in office from 1896 to 1911, the years of great immigration. And they swung a number of key provincial liberals to Borden's side. By mid-October, a union government of 13 Tories and 10 Grits was in place, a mere three liberals coming from Laurier's caucus. Only two members of the new government were francophones, the weakest ever Quebec representation in a federal cabinet, and a clear indication of the anti-conscriptionist sentiment in Quebec. Rural support for the government was also very shaky, especially in Ontario and the West, farmers fearing that they could neither plant nor harvest their crops if their sons faced conscription. In late November 1917, with the general election campaign by then underway, Borden's government resolved this problem very simply. Farmers' sons would not be conscripted. Conscription could take the other men, but not the farmers' sons. Indeed, the government supporters knew exactly those other men they wanted to see drafted. As the Tory Premier of Ontario, Sir William Hurst, said brutally, he would ensure that the people of Quebec are compelled to do their share before further sacrifices are demanded of Ontario. The general election of December 17, 1917, the first since 1911, was one of the most vicious in Canadian history. Borden's ministers had advised their leader that the unionist campaign should attack in press and on public platform the attitude of Quebec, and it did. A union government pamphlet flatly stated that if Laurier won, the French Canadians who have shirked their duty will be the dominating force in the government of Canada. Are the English people, English speaking people prepared to stand for that, it asked. Another government speaker declared that if Laurier wins, he will win leading the cockroaches of the kitchen of Canada to victory. Simply put, the domination of Canada by French Canadians could not be permitted. As Borden wrote in his diary, and as he genuinely believed, our first duty is to win at any cost the coming elections in order that we may continue to do our part in winning this war and that Canada be not disgraced. Spurred by this propaganda campaign, 
women voters mobilized for the union government. And soldiers overseas, one government organizer wrote, were lined up by their commanding officers who told them plainly what they wanted them to do as a matter of duty. Overwhelmingly English speaking, only the Van Dues of the 50 infantry battalions in the Canadian Corps was French speaking, the troops did their political duty. 92% of the soldier vote going to the government candidates, enough to swing 14 seats from Laurier to Borden under the particular and peculiar terms of the Military Voters Act. Against this barrage of slander and electoral manipulation, Laurier could do little. His English-speaking candidates took a host of different positions, some supporting conscription, some merely supporting Laurier. One of his Quebec supporters stated his own position. Laurier is a liberal, a Canadian patriot. Above all, he is Laurier. As for the leader himself, his position on the war was clear. I believe that our first and pressing duty is to share in the fight, Laurier said. I believe that it is our immediate duty to help our armies to support them with men, but not with conscription. We began with the voluntary system and it is our duty to continue with it. The result of the election was decisive. Borden won 153 seats while the Liberals took 82. Ontario delivered 74 seats for the government, while in Quebec, Laurier took all but three English-speaking seats. As predicted, the Francophone ministers went down to defeat. The impact of the women's vote was hard to measure, but Quebec had only 20% of its population enfranchised. Ontario, on the other hand, which had had massive enlistment, had 39% an indication that soldiers' female relatives were much more numerous there. In the West, Saskatchewan, with a heavy immigrant population, had 23% of its population enfranchised, a figure that suggested that the Wartime Elections Act had exactly the effect its drafters had wanted. At the same time, 117 seats won by the Union government were rurally based, the pledge not to conscript farmers' sons had paid off in spades. Now, by the time of the election in mid-December, no men had been called up for service as yet. The process of notifying potential draftees to report had begun in October. People were going through their appeals for exemption. And what is absolutely striking is that virtually every man called up for service wanted to be exempted from service. It's not just francophones. In Ontario, 118,000 of the 125,000 men called up filed for exemption. In Quebec, the numbers were 115,000 out of 117,000. Nationally, the percentage asking to be exempted from military service was 93.7. Everyone in Canada knew of the high casualties and brutal conditions at the front. Few of those who had not already volunteered wanted to go. Local tribunals handled the exemption uh, appeals, granting many and refusing some. But many men eventually would go. On March 21st, 1918, the Germans launched a massive attack on the British lines on the Western Front, smashing through the lines, creating near panic in London, Paris, and Ottawa. The pressure to put men into uniform increased dramatically, provoking bloody riots in Quebec City and a cabinet decision to cancel all exemptions for men between the ages of 20 and 22. The only grounds for exemption now were the death, disablement, or service of other members of the same family while on active service. In other words, the farmers and most every other person who had an exemption was now compelled to serve. 
The shocked outrage in the rural West and rural Ontario now matched that in Quebec. And the farmers' political organizing, already proceeding apace, speeded up. The Conservatives would pay a heavy price in the coming years. The first men called up reported for service in January 1918. And before long, unhappy recruits were in training. In May 1918, the first conscripts reached the front in France and Flanders, and soon there were casualties. But there were in total some 620,000 men, counting 100,000 conscripts, in all enlisted in the expeditionary force. There were 425,000 volunteers who served overseas and more in Canada. And 345,000 men and nurses served in France and Flanders. Of that number, 236,000 officers and other ranks served in the 50 infantry battalions in the Canadian Corps, where most of the casualties were suffered. Yet, as the charts in the Army official history of the Great War show, of the 100,000 men conscripted in Canada, only 24,132 served in the field with the Canadian Corps before the armistice on November 11th. Only 24,132, I wrote in my history of conscription, broken promises, and that number I used to regale my students with every year. And for that paltry number, French and English Canada, rural and urban Canada, labor and capital were bitterly divided in 1917, 1918, as they had never been before. Let me admit at once that I was flatly wrong to argue what I told my students for 30 years at York University. In the first place, 24,132 conscripts reaching the front lines numbered more men than were found in any single division of the Canadian Corps. That was a substantial number, almost a quarter of the frontline strength of the Corps' ranks. Then too, the war had been expected by the Allies to continue well into 1919. If that had occurred, the full 100,000 conscripts, and probably more, would have reached the front. And those conscripts were essential if the Canadian Corps' ranks were to remain at full strength. Understrength battalions suffered more casualties in trying to take their objectives. Full strength units, their firepower and maneuverability maximized, simply did better on the battlefield. And there's one final point. When on August 8, 1918, the Canadians, Australians and British struck the German lines at Amiens, France, and punched a huge hole in them, the war shifted from trench warfare to open warfare. The Canadian Corps proved to be expert, the shock troops of the British Empire in open warfare, and they would be used as such for the next hundred days as the campaign that ended the war was labeled. After Amiens, the Canadians moved north, cracked the Drocourt-Quéant line, crossed the Canal du Nord, liberated Cambrai and Valenciennes, and pursue, pursued the Germans to Mons. These battles were the most important ever fought by Canadian troops, our nation's greatest battlefield victories. And they might truly be said to have won the war, as the Canadian Corps, by itself, four divisions, 100,000 men, smashed 43 German divisions, or a quarter of the enemy's strength on the Western Front. But they were costly battles, with 45,000 casualties in the 100 days from Amiens to the armistice, some 20% of all casualties in the four years of the Great War. Without those 24,000 conscripts, without the conscripts still en route to France and Flanders, the Canadian Corps might have been forced to seize its operations for want of men. That is what happened to the Australians at the end of September 1918. For a century, we did not know the role that conscripts played in the Canadian Corps in these crucial months of the war. There's a new book just out by Patrick Dennis, 
who was in the audience, called Reluctant Warriors, Canadian Conscripts and the Great War, and it now tells us what we didn't know. Dennis, a retired Air Force colonel, does so in part by focusing on members of his extended family, who he discovered were called up under the Military Service Act and served at the front. His grandfather was conscripted, as was his first cousin and two more distant relatives. Three of his family were killed in action, and his grandfather suffered serious wounds. Of course, he says, this was a very small sample, but it was not entirely consistent with Canadian historiography that dismissed the conscripts as inconsequential, as I had, and because they were reluctant warriors of little value in action. Hilaire Dennis, a conscript from Windsor, Ontario, and Patrick's grandfather, was assigned to the 18th Battalion in the 2nd Division, and he wrote home on August the 23rd, 1918, that he was alive and lucky to be able to give you some news tonight, because I have been through something most awful in the last few days. Private Dennis added that he believed the prayers of everyone at home had protected him from the awful claws of this machine of destruction over here. A few days later, Dennis's unit fought in the advance to the Drocker count line. His battalion was in the thick of the fight on the enemy's main line of resistance. He wrote that we had to walk through dead bodies all over, and then I was wild. I was right after blood. Uncle, he said, it is funny how a man changes when he gets in a scrap like that. We always get a drink of rum before we start anything and then we can go through fire or do anything. On August the 28th, he was wounded when his battalion was cut to pieces in the attack against a well-defended enemy position. I figure myself very lucky to be able to write to you today, he began a letter from his hospital bed. His battalion had spent a wet night under heavy artillery fire, which was bad enough to drive a man crazy. So after getting the order to go ahead out of the trench, we went over the top, straight for the German line. And when we got within a thousand yards, what an awful reception we got. Fritz opened up with his machine gun, and it was just like a hailstorm, forced by a hundred mile an hour wind. Reluctant conscript that he might have been, Private Dennis did his duty. He was wounded in the back and in the hip in the service of his country, and his mates, if we can judge by the relative absence of critical comment in diaries, memoirs, and official records, the great majority of them also did their duty. Colonel Dennis estimates that some 1,500 conscripts were killed or died of wounds, and some 6,000 were wounded. In other words, conscription worked militarily, but it left bitter memories in Quebec especially the broken promises of no conscription for overseas service long remembered. Compulsory service left the Conservative Party in ruins, scorned by Quebecois and farmers. Its legacy was the long liberal reign that lasted from 1921 to 1957, R.B. Bennett's interregnum accepted. But Sir Robert Borden had achieved his goal of sustaining the Canadian Corps at the front. To those who accused him of breaking his pledges against conscription, his response was to ask if the nation had not made solemn pledges to support the soldiers at the front. Did those promises not take precedence? A determined man, Borden had done what he believed to be right and necessary. And who can say that he was wrong? I did once say that he was wrong, I don't any longer. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from Dr. Grandestine? You were talking earlier about the uh, demographics, and I wondered if there is um, any uh, reporting or knowledge of the Aboriginal component. There are numbers that are a little uh, wobbly. Most of the numbers in the first war are pretty wobbly because of the way records were taken and kept. Um, 
What is striking to me is that most of the Aboriginal bands, I guess uh, Indian bands they would have been called then, uh, sought exemption from conscription on the grounds that uh, they had a deal with the king 300 years ago and that took precedence over anything the Canadian government wanted. Notwithstanding that, something like 3% of Aboriginal men served. Uh, a low percentage, uh, not somewhat more than Francophones, somewhat less than native-born English Canadians, English-speaking Canadians. Uh, among them were some very successful soldiers, snipers and others. Uh, Francis Pegambabo, for one, was the great sniper of the Canadian Corps. But there's now a growing literature on on uh, Aboriginal service in the First War and in the Second War, and in the treatment of Aboriginal soldiers after they returned home, which was shockingly bad. So there's a, a growing body of evidence. Uh, I thought, always thought the record was in fact somewhat less than it should have been. Jack, I'd like to thank you on behalf of all of the nurses for mentioning that because I belong to the Canadian Nursing Sisters Association here and we have a lady who's 100 who served, and very often we talk about medicine. I happen to be a nurse as well. Um, so many soldiers have written about the nurses and the place that they play and the role they played. Other people in different support systems, but thank you very much. Um, many soldiers seem to have married their nurses that they met in the hospitals. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, the fact that 90% or more than 90% of men um, asked for exemption from uh, conscription is, uh, well, it was sort of new to me. I don't know if it's uh, shocking for anybody else, but could you maybe elaborate or ex explain that further? Was it social pressures, economic pressures, or does it, was it the morality of, uh, of men that uh, sort of pushed them to get exemptions, or what was it? They didn't want to go. That's the reason. People were getting killed over there. Why would you want to go? If, if you want me to go, you have to order me to go. You can't expect me to volunteer for something like that. Now, the extraordinary thing, and this is the point in Patrick Dennis's book, is that once they were put into uniform, they did their duty. They served as well as men who volunteered. There was really no way of telling them apart in their service. And the other thing that, that needs to be said is that that was true in the Second World War. We sent 16,000 conscripts overseas uh, in early 1945. Uh, a few saw action, but they served as well as anybody else. Uh, you can't order men to volunteer. You can order them to join the military, but I guess then we can expect that they will do as well or at least come close to volunteer. Not every volunteer was a saint. Not every volunteer was a, a war-winning uh, soldier. There were slackers and uh, uh, people who shirked every duty they could see. I, I spent some time in the army and God knows there were, we were all volunteers, but there were people who shirked their duty every day. It happens. Volunteers and conscripts both could act the same way. Thank you very much. Full disclosure, I'm French Canadian, so I always uh, appreciate your perspective on this because I, I think it's rather complete. Uh, th the one thing, though, that I would say is not, I don't read as much about is to talk about the courage that those volunteer or con conscript from Quebec showed because once they did join the army, they were uh, also being ostracized, not as much by the people they, they were in the army with, but often by the politicians and the press from particularly either England or English Canada. Could you comment on that? I don't think that's so, actually. I think uh, the Francophones who served did so against the social pressure in the province of Quebec. Pressure was not to go. But there was also a clear element of pride in the record that the Vandus compiled at the front. The Vandus had a very good record in the field. 
they also had, by chance, the highest number of executions of any battalion in the field, of men who uh, <laughs> deserted and were executed. Um, the difficulty is that English Canada never forgot or forgave World War I and the Quebec lack of enthusiasm for the war. And the Second World War compounded that. In the First War, I estimated that 15,000 volunteered and perhaps under 50,000 served, counting conscripts. In World War II, my estimate, and again, these are estimates, 150,000 French-speaking soldiers served out of 1.1 million. So it, it's about 12% uh, uh, in World War II and only something like 8% in World War I, counting the conscripts. So it's a... Uh, it's less than, than one might expect, but you need to understand the social and demographic things that drove people to enlist in, in both of the world wars. It, there were only certain groups that felt obliged to serve. Men who'd been in the militia felt an obligation, officers especially. People like this man, who was a militia officer, went overseas quite willingly and cheerfully. It was his duty. Uh, others felt exactly the same. In Quebec, where the militia had been scanted, where Sam Hughes, the minister in 1914, was anti-French and anti-Catholic, uh, where recruiting was bungled dramatically, things didn't work out that way in the First War. So it's, it's a complicated story. I'm not for a minute saying that Francophones were cowards. I'm not saying they were even all slackers. Many in English Canada said that. I'm saying that there were things that determined how events played out in Quebec and in the rest of the country. Uh, Jack, on this, this issue about the, the rate of um, volunteering among the Quebecois, I have heard that uh, some, I don't know how many, some Quebecois came across the border to Ontario and signed up there, and therefore their attestation papers suggested that they were uh, English Canadian. Is there any truth to that? Uh, Pierre Desmarais, English Canadian. No, there's no truth to that. So I was in Quebec City this summer, and of course, if you go to the Citadel, you, you hear about the uh, significant contribution of the, uh, the, the 22nd in, in terms of both the First and Second World War. But if you go on other historical tours, people still talk about the riots that happened uh, as a result of the crisis. So it's in, I'm glad to have heard your, your views from a military perspective, but do you, do you have a view about, in, in consideration of the political cost, and which continues to resonate today. Do you, do you have a view about whether it was worth the price? Politically, conscription was a disaster for the Conservative Party, period. It took the Conservatives until John Diefenbaker won Quebec in 1958 to recover from conscription in 1917, 1918. Uh, so in terms of the political cost, huge for the Conservative Party. And the way conscription was managed in World War II was by Mackenzie King, was totally based on the way Quebec had reacted to it in World War I. It shaped the Canadian war effort in World War II as well. It's important, I think, to realize that uh, Quebec City was the scene of the big riots in Easter, at Easter 1918, and people were killed. Uh, there's some new research coming out by francophones that suggests that in some cases the first shots were fired by civilians, not the soldiers. On the other hand, there's also no doubt that the soldiers went, went into Quebec City from Ontario with a clear desire to punish the bloody frogs. I mean, there's, you find all sorts of letters saying precisely that. Uh, make them fight. Uh, it's... It's a complicated story shaped by four years of war, by the memory of, uh, of all the dead, by the history of 250 odd years of Quebec versus Anglophones in British North America. It's a complicated story. Militarily, 
it worked in 1918. It didn't work really in the Second World War. Politically, it was a disaster, period. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Jack. <clears throat> this has been another in the series of podcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find notices of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives on our website at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the Institute, this is Eric Morse saying please subscribe to our YouTube channel, and thank you for listening.